I'm back for chapter 12, Immobility. So what is immobility? Well, it's a restriction imposed on all or part of the body. Physical factors that affect mobility would be joint disease, paralysis, pain keeps you from moving, psychological factors, whether that be fear or depression, Psychosocial changes can impair mobility. Um, maybe you've lost a loved one, so you tend to be withdrawn and just uh, stay in one place, curl up in a ball, so to speak. Help patients maintain normal functioning as long as possible. So keep our patients moving, and we're going to learn a little bit more about passive and active range of motion, um, isometric exercises to keep our patients strong. See nursing care plan for preventing hazards of immobility. And if patient is in a wheelchair, be sure that you have them shift their weight every 15 minutes. So that, because you know, if you have a bigger patient, or even if they're just sitting, remember that whole body is putting pressure on their buttocks, or if their sacrum is pushing against the back of the chair, or their hips are hitting the side of the chair, it all can put pressure. So if they can just move around a little bit in their chair, it really helps any pressure areas. Well, immobility in older adults. Well, older adults' environment can promote or hinder mobility. So depending on if they're in the bed or if they're active or if there's chairs it, or stairs, it just depends uh, how their environment is. Hospitalized older adult can quickly become debilitated and dependent as a result of being inactive, just bed rest, Maybe they have a disease that makes them on bed rest. Pain can almost immobilize you because every time you move, it hurts. Arthritis is a good example, hurts all over. Drugs can make you sedated and not move. Various therapies such as bed rest or traction, good example. Um, you really can't move around well because you have weights holding you into an alignment. We're going to talk about traction more later. Uh, an unfamiliar environment. So if you don't know, let's say you're spending the night with someone, or your loved one is spending the night, it's unfamiliar to them. And if they wake up in the night, they might get confused. Sometimes the medication they take might make them confused at night. And I'm sure you've all heard of sundowner syndrome. And it, it seems true, when the sun goes down, some people get more confused. I think shadows cause a problem. Um, they can't see as clearly because we know that their eyesight um, is a diminished. Well, exercise. Exercise is important. It's the best medicine for immobility. So active and passive exercises can be done with a patient lying down in bed, sitting in a chair, or even standing upright. So a well individual of any age can walk, participate in aerobic exercises, swim, engage in sports activities, garden or do housework. But if they get ill or disabled, um, then they, don't have the ability to do their normal activities, but they can still engage in some form of exercise, regardless of the severity of their illness. So there's active exercise, and that's where the patient moves themselves. They can turn from side to side, and if you can encourage your patient to do the active exercises in bed, it's very helpful. Lift their legs up, lift their arms up and down, help turn to the side of the bed, change their position. They can do that by themselves. Sometimes you have to remind them, but you should. And then there's passive range of motion or passive movement exercise. And that's movement of the patient's body performed by the therapist or the nurse 
without assistance from the patient. So again, grab a joint and you can move their arm up and down, back and forth. Same with their leg, grab a, a joint because you don't want to grab them like a calf because what if they um, you injure their soft tissue? Uh, nurses must be aware that exercise is the best prevention of immobility related disorders. Puts a lot of pressure on us, doesn't it? So the range of motion exercises. So they help prevent disabilities of the musculoskeletal system as well as other systems. So when you move your body, just the actual movement helps the blood flow. So that's why it helps other systems. The blood flow keeps the blood moving, helps the organs get their oxygen, right? So any kind of movement can help the other systems besides the muscular skeletal system. Also, muscular activity maintains a range of motion. So you can see that little picture at the bottom. It's not a great picture, but it does show you the different ranges. And if you even look at, do it yourself. You know, you bring your arms in, extend them. You can put them in front of you. You can raise them up. You can do the same with your legs. That's a range of movement or motion. A contracture is the shortening of muscles and tendons. So like if someone has had a stroke and has not had range of motion done, their muscles are going to shorten and their arms going to be contracted into that position. I'm sure you've seen that. It almost looks like their arms in a sling because it's contracted. Some muscles have shortened and some have lengthened. Um, and their tendons shorten as well. When I say lengthen, it would be like if your arm is bent, the outside of the arm is a little bit longer, but the inside of the arm is short, so you can't really extend that arm out because of the shortening. Uh, normal tissue is replaced by fibrous tissue, and that's in a contracture, and the muscles shorten and lose elasticity. Once you've got it, it's real got a contracture or a shortening, it's really hard to loosen it up. So um, do, let's just not let it happen. That's what I say. Uh, rotation, flexion, extension, adduction, adduct, abduction. So bringing it towards the body, adduction, taking it away from the body, abduction. The same with the feet, flex, and extend, right? Lift the legs up, move the feet, rotate the shoulders. And we know how some people can get kyphosis. So helping them straighten up, helping them be erect can help their range of motion and prevent things from happening. So what are isometric exercises? Well, that's muscle toning without moving a joint. So what happens here is you contract your muscles and you can even do it right now with your legs. Just tighten up your legs, maybe count to 10 and then release it. And then tighten it up again and release it. You can do the same with your arms. Bring it in like you're getting strong. Bring those arm, the hands in. Hold it for 10, tightening it up, and then relax. You can have your patients do that. Those are called isometric. They're especially helpful in maintaining muscle strength after a fracture. Even if it's a hand, strengthening the hand. Squeeze the hand, hold it, release the hand. Isometric. So how do we position our patients? Well. This is going to be really important throughout your whole nursing career, that two hours. Change your patient's position every two hours, turn them every two hours, give them a drink every two hours. It's easy to remember. I really encourage you to try to remember that mantra that I have. Turn, cough, deep breathe, take a sip of water every two hours. It prevents a multitude of problems. So. 
uh, change the patient's position every two hours to prevent undue pressure on the skin. So that moving every two hours not only prevents undue pressure, but it also keeps that blood flowing that we talked about, right? Uh, preventing sluggish blood flow, a maybe even a decrease in the blood pressure and heart rate. And that can be injurious to a, a patient, an elderly patient. Maintain joints, this is important, in their functional position. So if you have your patient lying in the bed and you've positioned them with pillows like you learned in the skills lab, position them for comfort with pillows, propped under their arm, they're laying on their side. So get at the foot of the bed. Are they in a functional position or are they some distorted looking position? Does it look normal? If they're lying supine, look, are they laying straight or is one side shorter than the other? So it's really important to maintain joints in their functional positions so that they're not abnormally flexed or extended. Another way is to use a footboard. Now some facilities have footboards um, splint, you can even use high top tennis shoes. That helps prevent foot drop. It's really important in a patient maybe who's had a stroke or who's been in an accident, um, maybe even a broken neck or paraplegic. Um, you don't want them to get foot drop. So footboards, splints, high top tennies, maintain proper positioning for patients in bed. That's when they're lying supine. Avoid positioning the patient with the knees and hips flexed too much because that's not our normal position, too much. It's just in a normal, almost like sitting type of position that you wanna flex their knees. So there's some uh, certain pressure points that we have uh, I talk about that in figure 12.1. So if you want to turn to that, because the picture I have here on the slide isn't that great. It's on page 196. So you can see the heels are a pressure point. Posterior calf can be a pressure point. Sacrum, the spinous processes, so the spinal cord, the, the processes, uh, the vertebrae. The elbows can be a pressure point. Scapula, the back in the back. The back of the head can even be a pressure point. Now if you go to the next picture, when they're laying on their side, even the ear can be a pressure point. Ribs, the greater trochanter on the hip, medial and lateral, uh, so like the, the knee joints, and the malleolus, that uh, ankle bone. And if they're laying prone, you can see the pressure points. And, and here's that picture in a wheelchair. So you can see how certain pressure points can be in a wheelchair. So that's why we want to have them move every uh, 10, 15 minutes, right? So I just wanted you to notice those pressure points. Uh, if we were in the classroom, I'd bring in a Mr. Skeleton, but we'll have to use our pictures, and you can feel on yourself those bony prominences. Or on your young one, you can tickle them and their bony prominences. And even name them. Hey, this is your sacrum. They might learn a new word. So the development of pressure ulcers. We do not want them to develop this, right? And why do they develop it? Because they have pressure in one point. They haven't been moved. And pressure injuries are expensive to treat. They result in longer hospital stays. They increase the likelihood of placement in a long-term care facility. And they increase mortality. They can lead to infection. And the patient can get septic. So besides not moving a patient around with mobility, um, immobility can cause pneumonia as well, right? If we're not having them cough and deep breathe and we're not moving them around so they have to breathe, take a deep breath to move, 
they can get pneumonia as well. But right now I'm going to talk about the pressure injuries. So erythema, what is that? It's the beginning of a pressure injury and a sign that capillaries in the area have become congested. Now this is really important for you guys to remember. It's in your book too. Erythema is the beginning of a pressure injury and a sign that capillaries in the area have become congested. So it's like some, it's a little red because impaired blood flow, it's pressure. It can occur within an hour or two in persons with healthy skin and adequate circulation. So imagine someone who doesn't have healthy skin and adequate circulation. Factors in addition to mobility that contribute to the development of pressure injuries are shearing. Remember the word shearing from skills lab? So instead of dragging your patient up in bed, you're going to use a pull sheet and you're going to lift and pull them up. But if you pull them from under their armpits and drag them up, you're shearing. So the sheets are going one way and you, the patient's going the other way and it shears their fragile skin. Chemical irritants such as urine. So if you let a patient lay in their urine, it's going to irritate their skin. And remember, urine can be acidic as well. So it's chemical irritant. Sedation. So if patients over sedated, they don't move and they can lay there and develop a pressure injury. Poor nutrition can lead to pressure injuries. So if they're not getting enough nutrition, their skin can be more fragile and they'll be more susceptible to pressure injuries. So let's prevent pressure ulcers. How do we do that? Well, the best prevention is frequent position change. Do not massage pressure points because you can cause injury. Any type of massage around or on a reddened area of skin can damage fragile capillaries. And that's part of that don't massage those fragile reddened areas, which are pressure points. Identify those at risk by using the Norton scale. Now I have an example of the Norton scale. Um, you rate a patient as to their pressure ulcer risk. Um, like is their physical condition good, fair, poor, or bad? And then you give them a number. And then you total that score up and, um, and see if they're at risk or not. So the Norton scale you guys have on your, um, in your book is on page 197 and you can see the Norton scale for the identification of those at risk for development of pressure ulcers. And obviously Dr. Norton did that, huh? All right. But you will see this um, in facilities. Again, pressure injury prevention, good skin care, Keep the skin clean and dry. Moisturize dry skin. Use protective creams. If they're incontinent of urine, there's certain creams that help protect the skin. I know you can't be there every time someone urinates. It's hard to anticipate the best of care. Um, so that sometimes you need protective creams. Don't rely on them, but you can. you might need them sometimes. Pressure reduction, alternating pressure mattresses. So that's like the little airflow mattresses that change the pressure intermittently. There's usually like a little machine at the end of the bed that's supposed to be turned on and it just uh, airflow. It's not like a water bed. They do have water beds like that too, but um, it's much better in a facility if it's an air filled mattress. Um, the bed elevation no more than 30 degrees. Improve mobility by repositioning devices such as overhead trapeze. Those are great. Um, if your patient doesn't have an overhead trapeze but they have arm strength, you can always ask your doctor for an order. 
because it does a couple things. It helps the patient pull up, which is almost pull-ups, right, for strengthening. It also helps them be self-sufficient. It helps them lift up their buttocks a little bit so you can change their draw sheet. It helps them be able to change position on their buttocks. So it really gives them self-esteem. Use a draw sheet to lift, not life, lift and turn. It reduces friction and shearing. And then be sure adequate nutrition and hydration. Giving a fluid, a sip of fluid with your medications um, and in between. So more prevention of pressure injuries, educate your patients, their caregivers, other staff members, and families about risk factors. So if you've been taking care of a patient and you know for a fact that they um, are at risk for a pressure injury because they don't move around a lot, maybe you could put that in the care plan so it can be communicated to everyone. Effective communication, discuss strategies to prevent skin breakdown. Again, care plan is a good place. Uh, injuries occur, assess. If injuries occur, assess and describe the stage of injury. Again, document, documentation, accurate documentation. And when you measure injuries or ulcers, take a tape measure and actually measure that. That way, if it's a nickel size, well, that's pretty descriptive, a nickel size or a quarter size injury or redness. Um, be descriptive, or you might say three inches or two, three by two inches. That way, it does a couple things. It covers you because you've documented what it was when you had them. So if the next nurse comes along and it's bigger, it could be on that right? Because you documented was it, what it was like when you took care of the patient. So documentation is really important, um, not just in pressures, but also in wounds. If you happen to see redness in a wound, document how big that redness is. How many inches is that redness? And how red is it? Is it dark red, pink red? Is there any oozing from it? Document. So the stages of pressure ulcers. Now there's some really good pictures on in box 12.4, which is on page 198. So stage one is non-blanchable erythema. And you can see there the redness. Intact skin with non-blanchable redness of a localized area, usually over a bony prominence. Stage two, is really important to know. So stage two is partial thickness. Sometimes it presents as a shiny or dry shallow ulcer. Stage three is full thickness skin loss. You can see that in your picture. Stage four is important too. It's a bad one. So it's full thickness, tissue loss, it can be blackened, and it can have purulent drainage. So if you were asked about that, that is a stage four ulcer. And what is the blackened part? Well, that's dead tissue. It's necrotic tissue. And we don't remove that. Um, the doctor has to cut that out. You do not know what's underneath. That, tish, that blackened tissue. So like, um, I'm looking at the picture, the deep tissue injury, that's deep tissue. But sometimes you'll see patients that have like a black eschar across their skin. You don't know what's underneath that, how deep the wound is. So only a doctor can remove that. You should not cut that away, please. And then also notice, is there any purulent drainage or even odor? So some additional stages, and it shows in the pictures there, unstageable or unclassified, deep tissue injury. And again, um, I put this here for the visual effects. 
<laughs> you got audio and visual. So how do we prevent pressure ulcers? Well, first step, identify those at risk. And that's your Norton scale, is identifying those at risk according to their medicines, uh, their health condition. Let's look at that Norton scale. Are they incontinent? Are they mobile? Are they active? Their mentation and their physical condition. A prevention protocol would be good skin care and the heels. Uh, if you put lotion on their heels and then put socks on, it really keeps that skin moist. We don't want dry heels that can crack and break and it breaks the skin barrier. And then that lets in infection. We don't want to break that skin barrier. Pressure reduction. And that's by turning the patient. Accessible and adequate support. Pillows. Um, sometimes they have the foam. Uh, sometimes I used to, if I didn't have any pillows, you can take a blanket and roll it up and put it behind their back to keep them on their side. Otherwise, they may want to tend to roll on their back. Improved mobility. We don't want them to be injured. We want to improve mobility, getting them stronger and up and moving around. Be sure they get adequate nourishment. Uh, educate them, educate the patient and their caregivers, and effective communication amongst each other and amongst the patient as well. So treatment of pressure ulcers, uh, stage one and two, clean with mild soap and water or normal saline. Avoid any paste, creams, ointments, or powder because they may provoke, promote infection in the ulcer. And again, you know, if you have a wound care nurse at the facility, they'll do a lot of this. They'll, they may write the order because they will be an RN or an LVN who can write orders also. But um, the doctor also can write, especially when you start getting into stage three and four and you get into a uh, more intense type of care. Avoid using alcohol, antiseptics, disinfectants, topical and or oral antibiotics, and massage. The effectiveness has not been proven and they may actually cause harm. Now, that word massage, I mentioned don't massage a reddened area. But if you want to give a good back massage, that's good. That relaxes the patient. It provides good skin care. Right? So massage is great. Uh, the most effective dressing for a stage one or two pressure provides a moist environment and maintains a temperature close to body temperature. So here's where you might see a wet to dry type of dressing. And that's normal like saline, normally saline. Wound healing is enhanced when the ulcer can take up oxygen. So a lot of times it's better not to have something on it. But when I talk about a moist environment, that would be a saline. Maybe when they're in bed, but um, you also want to provide some oxygen for it. So you don't want to keep it covered all the time, especially if they are turned on their side and that wound is to the air. Now stages three and four, patient may need analgesics before a dressing change. Please do that. There's no reason to make our patients scream in agony. So 30 minutes to an hour before a dressing change if you know it hurts. And that's another thing you should document, that you know that it's uncomfortable for the patient so that the next nurse, who may not be as smart thinking as you, they may not think about giving medication. So be sure you document that somewhere. More extensive treatment and supportive care 
irrigation devices, you might need spray bottles. Now most facilities have a um, wound dressing cart and that's where you will find all of these things to treat the pressure ulcer. Spray bottles to spray on, whether it be saline or cleaning, something to clean the wound with. A bulb and piston. And remember, if you use it on a patient, don't keep using it from patient to patient. It just if, if you're going to use a bulb and piston on a patient, that should be that patient's. Uh, same with syringes. So syringes are good for rinsing off. You can uh, get saline in a syringe, especially sterile, and uh, rinse off the wound. Especially, let's say it's a sacral wound and you just had to clean them up because they were incontinent of stool. You really want to clean that wound out because that's really grounds for infection, right? Debridement of necrotic tissue, usually for granulation of new and healthy tissue. So removal of dead tissue is what's going to allow for new healthy tissue. And granulation is a process where it starts from the bottom and grows up. Normally, wounds don't just grow from the top down. It's from the inside up. Wet to dry dressings and whirlpool baths are good. I uh, had a patient who was in a car accident and uh, he was dragged on the uh, gravelly cement so they had to get all that gravel out of his wounds and he had some um, they call that road, road burn as well so they put him in a whirlpool bath and that helped debride some of that tissue and get out some of that gravel Surgery is preferred for advanced cases, so sedate the patient. Now, this next one, don't be grossed, maggot therapy. So, you know, maggots like to eat dead tissue. They also are good for like um, wound, other wound care, uh, plastic surgery, where it's gotten swollen and there's blood that's gone into the uh, tissues, they'll use maggots. It's not all the time and it does need an order. So don't just uh, take it upon yourself. I know you wouldn't do that. So rates of surgical complications are high because um, when they do a deep wound cleanse or a deep wound debridement, it's inflammation, irritation, could already have an infection that you're spreading, not you, but during surgery. Uh, bacteremia may cause high fever. Now bacteremia is like septicemia, right? It's got bacteria in the blood, fever, tachycardia, hypotension. Now these are things that we're going to talk about a lot in a lot of different body systems, a lot of different types of situations. Um, fever, tachycardia, hypotension, and altered mental status, you got to think there's a problem. Antibiotics may be needed pending culture. So before antibiotics are given, a lot of times a doctor will order culture and sensitivity. So what you'll do is maybe take a swab and they have these culture swabs and you take the swab out and you put that into the middle of the wound, the yuckiest looking area of the wound. And it may not just be an ulcer, it may be some other kind of wound. Uh, they're there for maybe healing of a hip surgery, but the wound looks infected. So you're gonna do a culture and then you put it into the tubing and crunch the bottom so it's a preservative and then you send that to the lab. The lab looks at it under the microscope and looks at the bacteria. What kind of bacteria is growing there? And then they will do different antibiotics to see what the, the bacteria is sensitive to. What, so that's a sensitivity. And then the doc, they'll recommend to the doctor um, these culture and sensitivity 
shows um, tet tetramycin or streptomycin, penicillin, augmentin, something will uh, help cure this. There's also a high poss possibility of MRSA, which stands for meth methicillin resistant organisms, and that is not good. It's hard to treat and it's rampant in facilities, MRSA. Here's a question. Common aging changes that place the older adult at risk for immobility and its consequences include all of the following except, I'll give you a minute, so the correct answer is D, D as in dog, rationale, common aging changes combined with common medical conditions place the older adult at risk for immobility and its consequences. Examples of physical changes with age are decreased flexibility and strength and changes in posture and gait. In addition, older adults typically have one or more chronic diseases that increase the likelihood of immobilization. So remember that. Um, I think that's a really good point. One or more chronic illnesses. So they can have COPD, hypertension, and diabetes. That's three. And you'll find a lot of people have many illnesses because remember, it wasn't always prevention. Right now we want to prevent illness before you waited till you had an illness and then treated it. So we're still dealing with the idea of, um, again, knowledge is power, but some people don't know. They don't know, they don't have the money or the insurance to go to the doctor and get a yearly exam. So we're dealing with uh, patients that have, haven't always been able to take care of themselves. Question number two. The most frequent site of skin breakdown is the, give you a minute. So the right answer is B as in boy, sacrum. If you think about all the ones that you've seen, they're usually on the sacrum, the lower uh, part of the spine, the upper part of the buttocks. So, uh, as far as percentages, the sacrum is 35%. Ischial tuberosities, which is the ischium, the bone that sticks out there at the hip, 16%. Heels, 11%. Trochanter, 7%. Ankles, uh, 3%. And scapula, 2%. All right, so let's talk about how these different this immobility can affect different parts of our body. So we're going to talk about respiratory status now. When a person is immobile or does not take deep breaths, thick secretions can accumulate and pool in the lower respiratory structures. So that's why we have our patients cough and deep breathe. Another really good thing is sighing helps the respiratory status because it makes them expand their rib cage. So effective coughing uh, may be difficult for some patients, so you might need to have um, a pillow for them to hold on to. If they've had surgery, they need to support that incision. So you can have, I used to take also a blanket and fold it up and tape it so that it was like a square that they could hold on to, or a pillow is good too. Sometimes it's just hard to find a lot of pillows. Um, individuals at risk for impaired gas exchange related to immobility would be patients prescribed medications that depress respirations. Morphine comes to mind. So anything that depresses the mental or neuro, neuro, neurological system is going to suppress respirations because we know our respiratory centers in our brain. That's part of the neurological system. Uh, patients wearing tight binders or bandages that limit chest expansion, like if they've had back surgery or abdominal surgery, 
big patients um, that might be have a pulling from the tissue on their wounds or if they had a big wound to start out with might have a binder. Patients with abdominal distension from gas, fluid, or feces, so that distension can move up and prevent the lungs from expanding down. So have your patients cough and deep breathe. So not breathing well, taking deep breaths and coughing is a major risk for pneumonia. Atelectasis can occur, which is the lung, collapsing of the base of the lung. And then that's where your alveoli are. So it interferes with normal exchange of gases. A lung infection associated with immobility is called hypostatic, because it's not moving, pneumonia. Have patient cough and deep breathe every two hours and change position. We've heard that before, haven't we? Monitor the respiratory status and their oxygen saturation. So I think I've told you before, get an O2 sat to keep in your pocket. You're gonna be a nurse, you need everything. So if you see a tr patient having trouble breathing, you can check their O2 saturation. Uh, you can monitor their respiratory status by checking their oxygen saturation. Count their respiratory rate. Also, listen to the lungs, anterior and posterior. So when you listen to their, let's say you listen to the front of their lungs, you're going to listen for crackles, which could mean there's some um, secretions there. So you would have them cough and deep breathe. I've had an instance, I walked in, a uh, patient was laying about 30 degrees, um, and I checked their O2 sat, and it was 89 sat there up in the bed, have them take a couple cough and deep breaths, and it raised it up to 94%. So maybe it's secretions that are blocking the airways. So we wanna have them cough. And we wanna count their respiratory rate, check their O2 saturation. I can't uh, tell you how important that is. Also, an incentive spirometer is another way. Instead of you saying, cough and deep breathe, you have them oh, just hand them that spirometer and have them uh, take a deep breath. So the idea is not to blow in it. It's to suck on it and to try to raise those uh, accordions up. We used to have little balls that we called. Um, it, that was our incentive spirometer, but now I believe it's uh, the like accordion type of, makes a little sound. So older adults are particularly prone to becoming dehydrated from inadequate fluid intake, and that can result in complications, confusion, constipation, urinary tract infections. So I can't push the importance of food and fluid intake. So a patient may have anorexia. Now that may be because they're weak, they're immobile, they have lost their appetite as a part of aging, maybe it's medication. Some other factors, anxiety about dependence on others and decreased metabolic needs resulting from inactivity. Inadequate fluid intake. Take a sip every couple hours. Getting up may be difficult and time consuming. So patients tend not to get up and they don't wanna ask for help. So it's up to us to dangle, to move them, help them get up in the chair. I don't want to. Well, you can't force someone, but you can encourage. And they might forget to take a drink. So we need to remind them to drink regularly. So some nursing interventions maintain INO. So we know how much they're taking in and we know their I should be equal to their O. So hopefully we can measure their output and we wanna be keeping track of their intake of fluids. 
offers small, frequent meals because an elderly person can eat a lot. They might not even feel hungry, but if they just eat a little here and there, maybe it'll add up to enough nutrition. Dietary supplements high in protein, like the protein shakes, um, they can have those from dietary, or even a family member could bring those in, as long as it's okay with the doctor because we don't want a fluid, if they're on a fluid restriction, we might have to watch out for that if they have heart failure. Offer fluids, even small sips of water or juice every hour while awake. Fluids need to be within reach of the patient. If they're able to take a drink, let them reach it. That helps, it helps movement, mobility, independence, but they've gotta be able to reach it. Encourage visiting family members to offer fluids while visiting. And maybe the family members know what their favorite fluids are. A lot of people don't like water. I admit that, my husband does not like water, he hates it. He likes soda, soda's not good, but if you gotta drink fluids, you gotta drink something. Juices would be great. Water infused with lemon or other fruit is good. Adds a little flavor to the water. And seltzer water is good too. Another problem of uh, immobility is constipation. So if the impulse to defecate is ignored for a considerable amount of time, the urge goes away. So changes in the usual routine and environment, inability to defecate on a bedpan because of embarrassment or discomfort, and weakened muscle tone, they, they um, just kind of hold it in. They can't push it out. We don't want them to strain, but because of the weakened muscle tone, they can't really push it out either, push the stool out. Uh, some medications slow intestinal mo motility, sorry. Um, pain medications are infamous for that. Valsalva maneuver or vasovagal reflex. So when a patient goes to the bathroom, I call this the Elvis Presley reflex because he died on the toilet. He was probably uh, constipated from all the pain medicines he was taking and he was straining to go to the stool, to go to the bathroom. He had a vasal vagal reflex, and it's not uncommon at all. There's a vagal nerve in the rectum. There's also a vagal nerve in the neck. But if that is stimulated, it can cause lightheadedness. It can slow their heart rate down also, which can cause a problem with heart patients, which is the Elvis Presley thing. Uh, confused patients may ignore the normal urge to have a bowel movement, and then it may pass, and then they don't go. Now, fecal impaction. This is important to remember about fecal impaction. If an impaction develops, that mass of feces can um, cause an obstruction, which is another problem. Um, you, I've had to disimpact people where you take a glove finger and you uh, have to dig out the stool. But remember, that's, there's a vagal nerve there and you don't want to stimulate that, which lowers the heart rate. But what is the definition of fecal impaction? Well, it's painful defecation. It gives a feeling of fullness in the rectum. They have a feeling of fullness, like they have to go, but they can't go. Their abdomen may be distended. They might have cramps, or they need to go. And sometimes they can't always verbalize it. They may just give that look of discomfort. So you, it might lead you to ask them. And also pushing on the abdomen when you do your abdominal inspection you can find some discomfort. Also, watery stool can be a sign of fecal impaction. And you think, well, really? Why is that? Well, because the liquid can go around the impaction. It's not unusual 
Just because they have a watery stool doesn't mean they're going to the bathroom. It could be an impaction. So you have to kind of look at the whole picture. Some nursing interventions. So um, remember here we mention again about straining or the Valsalva maneuver, my Elvis Presley maneuver, uh, my um, vagal reflex maneuver can cause lightheadedness and fainting. So be careful about your patient's straining in the toilet. Watch them. Keep an eye on them. Encourage foods with fiber. That's important to remember. Foods with fiber can help them go to the bathroom. Encourage fluids so they don't get dry stool. Remember, the colon is where, what? That's the fluid, right? Comes into the colon, to, is absorbed, and that's where we get a hard stool. But in, the more fluid you have, the softer the stool will be. And activity helps people go to the bathroom as well. So get your patient moving because we don't want immobility issues. Um, if possible, patients should use a bedside commode rather than a bedpan because it's more like the position of going to the bathroom. And a lot of people just can't go. They can't get comfortable on a bedpan, even if you elevate the head of the bed. So bedside commode if they can get up. Laxatives should be used sparingly However, stool softeners may be helpful if the stools are hard and difficult to pass. So in an earlier lecture, we had talked about how we um, might start out with a, a laxative orally, like milk of magnesia or something like that. Then we would go to a suppository and then an enema. But here, we all, most of your patients will probably be on a stool softener just prophylactically because most patients don't drink enough anyway and they don't get enough fiber. So they should be on a stool softener. And it, it helps make the stool easier to pass. Urinary incontinence is another problem of immobility. So this is important to remember. When the body is in reclining position for a few days. So think about lying prone in the, in the bed. The flow becomes sluggish from the kidneys to the bladder. So in the ureters, the flow becomes sluggish. Urine tends to pool. And that can set the stage for a urinary tract infection. It's really important to remember that. Kidneys must force urine into the ureters against the pull of gravity. So if they're laying down in a supine position, reclining position, um, they need gravity to help the kidneys get the urine. Now there is some peristalsis in the ureters that helps, but it doesn't totally help 100%. So you want to sit the patient up get them out of bed, sit them on the side of the bed so the kidneys don't have to force urine into the ureters against the pull of gravity. Uh, functional incontinence, what is that? Well, it's important to know that it's inability to respond to the urge to void in time. They're unable to get to the bathroom on time. So their incontinence is related to their function because they are unable to respond to the urge to void in time, or they're unable to get to the bathroom on time. Functional incontinence, important to remember. So how to prevent urinary incontinence? Put them on a toileting program. Maybe every two hours you come in and offer them, would you like to go to the bathroom? Would you like a bedpan? Would you like a urinal? Would you like to sit on the side of the bed with a urinal? Some sort of toileting where every few hours you offer going to the bathroom. It gives them a reminder that it's time to go in case they forgot or don't have the urge, um, but moving might give them the urge. Sometimes running water can help uh, encourage a patient to urinate. 
uh, nursing interventions schedule toileting based on the patient's usual pattern. So how do they normally go to the bathroom? Right after lunch? Right before lunch? Right before dinner? Hey, let's get up and go to the bathroom before dinner, and then we can sit in the chair for dinner time. It's a good idea. And maybe that's how they normally go. First thing in the morning when they get up, usually go to the bathroom. So try to get them to the bathroom or a bedside commode if they can't walk that far early in the morning. So there's circulatory effects that occur, occur that can occur also. Immobility is a risk factor for formation of blood clots or DVTs, deep vein thrombosis. So by not moving their legs, so that's why um, they have compression stockings, they have embolic, anti-embolic stockings, the white stockings that are tight. They also have um, these things that wrap around the legs that inflate and deflate to help uh, keep the circulation going in the legs to prevent blood clots. But the signs of a blood clot would be edema, warm, so like when you do your, um, oh shoot, what's the test? Homans, when you do your Homans test and you push against their foot, do they get pain in their calf? So do they have tenderness there, warmth there, edema in their ankle? It may progress to a pulmonary emboli. So if they have a thrombosis in their leg, it might get thrown into the lungs and get a pulmonary emboli, and you can die from a pulmonary embolism very quickly. It's, a, it's an emergency. Preventive measures, anticoagulants, blood thinners, um, even if it's baby aspirin or Coumadin. Um, nursing interventions, hydration, range of motion, Oh, I have hydration twice. It must be important. Okay, last but not least, immobility may result in lack of coordination and balance. If you've been in bed for a long time, when you get up, you have a lack of coordination and balance. It's amazing, and I'm sure you'll agree. You can exercise, exercise, get in great shape, and it takes a while but it doesn't take very long to get out of shape, does it? So think of the elderly. Immobility may result in lack of coordination and balance, increasing the risk of falling. So dangle your patient prior to getting out of bed that to prevent orthostatic hypotension. That's caused from immobility or medication, dehydration, Older adults may suffer from learned dependency syndrome. They learn to depend on you. They're either scared to do it themselves. Maybe someone's helped them so much they almost forget how to do things for themselves anymore. So we always want to encourage dependency, independency. Uh, other nursing interventions encourage social interaction, take the patient to um, the, the area where they do activities, where they eat with others, keep them out of the room, try to keep them out of the room, and encourage self-dependence as much as possible. Okay, thank you.